If you're a roller coaster enthusiast, it's very likely you have a few milestone coasters that are super important and or nostalgic to you. These may not be the best coasters out there, but they were your favorites from childhood that you rode several times a year growing up. For me, one of those coasters I rode a ton growing up is Mindbender at Six Flags Over Georgia, a 1978 classic Schwarzkopf looper. Compared to the sleek, modern steel coasters of today, Mindbender's nothing super special or iconic. In fact, it's pretty basic as far as looping coasters go, but it still offers a fun, enjoyable ride that I actually find to be pretty subtly brilliant. From its intense vertical loops and great use of terrain, to its smooth, well-paced, consistent ride, Mindbender stands today as a humble display of creative design, innovative engineering, and back-to-basics thrills. Let's find out what makes Mindbender a clever coaster. In 1976, Magic Mountain in Valencia, California opened the Great American Revolution. This was the first modern steel roller coaster in the world to feature a clothoid-shaped vertical loop, a huge breakthrough in the coaster industry brought to life by the German duo of engineer Werner Stengel and manufacturer Anton Schwarzkopf. Together they began building roller coasters in 1964, and their company quickly became one of the highest quality suppliers of thrill rides in the late 20th century. After the success of Revolution, Six Flags wanted in on the looping action, and decided to purchase two looping coasters for two of their own parks. These sister coasters premiered in 1978 as Shockwave at Six Flags Over Texas, just outside of Dallas, and Mindbender at Six Flags Over Georgia, just west of Atlanta. For these two coasters, Stengel and Schwarzkopf developed a never-before-seen box truss track design in an effort to minimize the need for a ton of track support, a track type that would influence the design of several other coaster manufacturers in the future, like Gerslauer and Mock Rides. Mindbender and Shockwave were also the first roller coasters to debut a new engineering method known as heartlining, in which the track rolls around the center mass of a rider's chest, rather than the center line between the track rails. This leads to a more comfortable experience and allows engineers to build more intense ride layouts without hurting riders. This would eventually become standard practice for all roller coaster designs going forward. Shockwave made headlines as one of the first roller coasters to feature two consecutive vertical loops back to back, as well as throw riders out of their seats with some strong pops of airtime. I have no issues admitting that Shockwave is absolutely the more intense and exciting of the two, but still, what Schwarzkopf and Stengel were able to build with Mindbender is something truly creative and unique. Mindbender opened at Six Flags Over Georgia on March 31st, 1978 as a part of an expansion of the USA section of the park, which was then named Jolly Rogers Island just two years later in 1980. Cleverly dubbed the world's first triple looping coaster, the ride includes two vertical loops and a diving inclined helix initially referred to by the park as a horizontal loop. Definitely a stretch, but that's 70s marketing for you. Thanks to Stengel's precise engineering and Schwarzkopf's quality manufacturing, Mindbender became an instant smash hit with the public. The ride was smooth, fast, and powerful, featuring great moments of intense positive Gs, lateral forces, and airtime. Schwarzkopf's wonderfully simple trains featured nothing but a simple lap bar restraint, giving riders plenty of upper body freedom and comfort. Werner Stengel also designed the 3,253 feet of track to take full advantage of the park's hilly terrain, placing the coaster on a hillside and having the track dive into a water-filled ravine twice to maintain high speed until the very end. The park made an effort to keep as many trees as they could so riders could dart in and out of natural foliage, providing a beautiful organic setting for the coaster to live. Over the years, Mindbender has gone through a few cosmetic changes. Upon debut, the ride donned a monotone silver paint scheme with silver trains that sported rainbow accents down the sides. Sometime in the mid-80s, the track was painted dark brown and the supports a lighter beige, giving the coaster a more rustic look. In 1997, Jolly Rogers Island was transformed into Gotham City, and Mindbender was painted bright green and given a light Riddler theme. The trains were painted black with many small green question marks all over the car bodies. In 2005, the trains were updated with a green accent stripe going down the sides. This is how Mindbender would look all the way through the end of the 2019 season. Finally, in 2021, Mindbender was given its most extensive upgrade yet. 
The ride was given a small name change to the Riddler Mindbender, a fresh coat of green paint, and a refurbishment of a section of the inclined helix. The park also replaced the control system, all the mechanical components, built a new operator's booth in the station, and provided a brand new set of purple trains designed by B&M. This refurbishment ended up neutering the ride experience a bit, but we'll get to that later. After boarding the train and departing the station, riders pass over the transfer track and straight up into a slow 80-foot lift hill. At the top, riders disengage from the chain and slowly cruise through a steady turn to the right before diving down an 80-foot, gently sloping drop. The train then rushes through its first of two 46-foot diameter vertical loops, slamming riders into their seats with five positive Gs. The train then gently rises up and flattens out high above the ride's ravine. Riders in the front row will get a nice pop of floater airtime cresting this hill. At the top, the train hits a left turn that dips and rises again. The train then banks hard left and races toward the ground with fury, hitting its top speed of 50 miles per hour. As the train bottoms out, riders are once again hit with crushing positive Gs before rising back up to where they started. Continuing left, the train crosses over the helix and dives down a straight drop that gives riders in the back row a small pop of air time. Hitting ground level and headed back up into the trees, the train levels out and curves to the right as riders in the front once again experience some gentle air time before being tossed to the left. The train coasts around the turn and lines up for one last straight drop down to the lowest point of the ravine. Riders in the back get thrown out of their seats for the strongest moment of airtime on the coaster, before diving down and rushing through the ride's final 5G vertical loop. The train rises up through a short underground tunnel and crests over a quick pop of airtime before cruising around one last dipping right turn and into the brakes. I first got to ride this roller coaster in the summer of 2000 as a 9-year-old just warming up to larger coasters. Having never ridden a looping coaster before, it took some hard convincing for me to get in line since the idea of going upside down really scared me. I will never forget riding up the lift hill and looking over my shoulder at the first vertical loop, heart pounding, knowing there was no turning back. As soon as we dropped down and sped through that vertical loop, I was hooked. Fast forward to today, and I've probably ridden Mindbender close to 300 times over the past 22 years, and I've picked up on so many little details that make it such an enjoyable coaster. First off, I love the sounds this thing makes. Schwarzkopf coasters have a deep, guttural chugging sound as they roll over track joints. And they also make this incredible hollow roar as they speed through vertical loops. It sounds angry and intimidating, but also exciting. The ride also looks beautiful. Its bright green structure sits so naturally among the wooded hillside, and the choice of placing the last vertical loop inside the inclined helix over the water is artistic as hell. The ride just looks and feels deeply rooted into the grounds of the park. And the modern box truss track design helps the ride not look as dated as other coasters of a similar age. Mindbender's layout is full of subtle and playful choices that are often overlooked, but they add so much character to the ride. I love how the track slightly dips and rises around each turn. It's a fun way to play with the speed, add surprise lateral forces, and build anticipation before the big drops hit. I love the gentle but quick pops of airtime that feel very vintage and playful, and something you only see in older coasters that were limited by the handwritten design methods of the time. I love how the drops before each vertical loop very gradually flatten out, so there's barely any positive g-force. This lets riders really feel the increase in momentum and prepare for the vertical loops to hit hard. The ride does a great job in warning you that you're about to go upside down. And I really love the choice of splitting up the two vertical loops to be at the beginning and the end of the ride. In a sense, Mindbender bookends the experience with its highlight moments, a wonderful way to keep the ride feeling consistently exciting without losing energy. Speaking of the loops, Schwarzkopf loops are my favorite vertical loops of any coaster out there. Their clothoid shape is so pleasing to the eye and punches you hard with positive Gs going in and coming out, and allows the train to give a brief moment of hang time at the top. The forces going through the loops are so smooth and not jarring at all. Perfectly executed. 
The ride is a masterclass in conserving momentum thanks to its perfect use of uneven topography. Despite the biggest drop on the ride being only 80 feet, the total elevation difference from the top of the lift hill to the bottom of the second vertical loop is 153 feet. But you can barely tell since the first half of the ride is hidden in the trees. What's most remarkable about Mindbender though is how closely it follows the rule of threes. There are three distinct moments of intense positive Gs, three distinct moments of negative Gs in both the front and the back of the train, and not counting the final right turn into the brakes, you experience three changes in direction, alternating right, left, then right. So you can see the layout is super balanced and contains a lot of sneaky symmetry across each direction of movement. Mindbender does so much more than just flip riders upside down here. It offers a complete experience that has almost everything you would want in a great roller coaster. Punchy positives, playful airtime, surprise laterals, great terrain usage, and a really nice sense of speed, all while being held in by just a lap bar. This has helped the ride age incredibly well over the years. It is a damn near perfect design, and Six Flags did quite the number on it when they decided to renovate it in 2021. After being closed for a lengthy refurbishment delayed for obvious reasons, Mindbender reopened in September of 2021. I didn't get a chance to ride it until March of 2022, but oh boy do I have some thoughts. Up through 2019, I called Mindbender a perfect roller coaster. The speed of the beefy 7 car 28 passenger trains was only lightly controlled, so it powered through the course with so much energy. The loops were extremely intense and the pops of airtime were strong. Those trains gave your upper body the freedom to move side to side, making the lateral moments feel more unhinged and chaotic. It was a serious contender for being one of the best classic roller coasters in the country. With the 2021 renovation, the park appears to have made a number of changes in an effort to preserve the ride and reduce maintenance needs, ranging from mostly good to straight up bad. Let's start with the mostly good. The new B&M trains are five car, 20 passenger trains, featuring a lap bar and a seat belt, along with seats that contour around your shoulders to hold your body upright. To try and make up for lost ride capacity, Six Flags purchased three new trains and added an extra block brake right behind the station, so they could run all three at once. But realistically, three train operations seems a little overkill for this ride, especially since the ride crew now has to check a lap bar and a seat belt. I've personally never seen the crew run more than two trains, and they still tend to stack behind the station for most cycles. If Six Flags is able to dispatch trains fast enough to justify three train operations, that would be amazing to see. But even with just two trains, the extra waiting block does help operations a ton. Trains can now park in the station about 30 seconds after the train in front dispatches. Originally, trains had to wait to advance into the station way back on the safety block, so this is a welcome change. And since two train operations seem to be what the crew is sticking with, I really wish the park would at least add a sixth car to the trains to get capacity just a little closer to what it used to be, but that'll probably never happen. The drive box panel was moved inward toward the middle of the station, and the air gates for the original first two cars were removed completely. This will never not be weird. <laughs> It kind of baffles me why Six Flags thought a gigantic operator booth was necessary for this coaster. But I'm sure the crew loves it. The new trains are pretty decent. While they don't look as good or feel quite as solid as the old ones, they're fairly comfy and ride pretty smooth. My guess is the trains were shortened to five cars in order to comply with newer ride force regulations as well as reduce stress on the track, though that comes at the sacrifice of a slightly less intense ride. That's completely fine to me, as long as the speed of the ride stays mostly the same. Unfortunately, it did not. This is where the bad changes come in. The park initially programmed the new trim brakes to slow the train down to a crawl. 
and sometimes even come to a dead stop right before the drop into the second loop. Now the ride has always had trim brakes, they just never affected the ride all that much because of how long and heavy the old trains were. But these new brakes combined with the lighter trains sucked a lot of the raw energy out of the coaster. This is what I experienced on my first post-renovation ride. No airtime or laterals whatsoever. Only semi-decent positive Gs in the loops. At one point, I thought we were gonna valley we were going so slow. It was not great. Weirdly though, the very next day, the park dialed back the trim brakes. That day, I was getting rides that felt speedy and forceful. The old mindbender began to emerge again. It still didn't feel quite as intense as it used to with the longer, heavier trains, but as the 2022 season went on, the ride gradually got closer and closer to pre-renovation speeds. By summer, the ride was honestly running fantastic. Then I came back in October, and this time the second trim brake was back to stopping trains. It was on this visit that I noticed how awful the new control system is. It seems to be crazy sensitive and causes super inconsistent ride cycles and a large amount of downtime. The trim brake before the second loop was constantly going back and forth between slowing it down but coasting through and stopping the train completely. The ride would often go down at the most random times. It was super frustrating to watch. I've been told Six Flags did the PLC programming in-house. If that's true, it seems they have a good amount of tweaking to do before they hit solid reliability. It's also really perplexing to me why Six Flags didn't opt for a magnetic braking system if their goal was to modernize the ride. The new friction brakes on the safety block and the waiting block stop the train hard on every single cycle, which jerks everyone forward. It doesn't matter if the block zone ahead is clear or not, you are stopping. Magnetic brakes would make for a much more comfy deceleration and could allow the train to coast through the block zones without stopping, helping boost ride capacity. Magnetic mid-course trims would probably help the ride have much less intrusive speed control too. At the very least, Six Flags could try to reprogram the brakes to slow trains down without stopping like they used to. I also briefly want to mention the refurbished Helix track doesn't feel any smoother than how it ran before. The potholes going over the track joints are still there. Personally, they don't bother me all that much, but it's still kind of funny that they were never corrected with the new track. While it's great to know that Six Flags cares a lot about this coaster and wants to keep it alive for many more years, it seems that, at least on my visits, Mindbender struggled to run consistently and still has some kinks to work out. And I can't help but think that there were some other viable companies out there to work with. For example, Riot Entertainment, together with Gerslauer, the company that descended from Schwarzkopf, offers a retrofit package specifically for Schwarzkopf coasters. New trains, new hardware, new control system, the whole shebang. Hershey Park contracted Riot Entertainment to upgrade their Super Duper Looper coaster in 2012, and it looks and rides so good. Why Six Flags didn't work with them is beyond me. Please remember these opinions are purely based on my personal observations with the ride this year. I am not a ride engineer, nor have I ever run a theme park before, and I'm sure there's a reason behind all the decisions made for the upgrade that I'm not aware of, and that's totally okay. I'm just a longtime fan of this coaster and want to see it provide the best experience possible for guests. When Mindbender's running fast like it was this past summer, it's still a wonderfully fun and intense coaster. When it's running slow, it's only semi-decently fun, but nothing memorable. I really hope the kinks will be ironed out and the faster speeds will return next summer, but whether they will or not is anybody's guess. No matter how fast or slow it runs though, Mindbender will always be my personal favorite ride in the park. While rides like Goliath, Twisted Cyclone, Superman, and Batman offer more thrilling and arguably better rides, I consider Mindbender to be the quiet beating heart of the Six Flags Over Georgia coaster collection for its historical value and uniqueness. And while it now firmly sits in the shadow of its Texas sibling, I can still admire the incredibly smart ride layout. There are very few coasters that can serve their momentum as well as Mindbender does on gravity alone. It will always be one of Werner Stengel's top tier designs. Mindbender knows exactly what it needs to be. 
It doesn't try hard to wow riders with eye-catching gimmicks. It is nothing more than a simple steel coaster built to take riders up, drop them down, throw them all around, and turn them upside down, and it is proud of it. There's something super charming about that. In today's world of hybrid coasters, giga coasters, triple swing launch coasters, among others, it's really nice to come back to a classic fundamental roller coaster that's just fun. Not super crazy or thrilling or life-changing, just pure nostalgic, playful fun. If you haven't ridden it yet, I highly recommend coming down to Atlanta and checking it out. Especially if you're a huge fan of Schwarzkopf coasters like I am. It has a 42-inch height requirement, so it's a perfect ride for kids willing to try their first upside-down roller coaster. Because it was the first ride to get me permanently hooked on roller coasters as a kid, I have a very deep, personal connection to Mindbender. It represents a massive step in my coaster riding journey of conquering my fear of looping coasters, and the euphoric feeling of victory that I not only survived it, but loved it. I owe a huge amount of gratitude toward Werner Stingel, Anton Schwarzkopf, and Six Flags Over Georgia. Without Mindbender, I wouldn't be the roller coaster enthusiast I am today. That's the mark of two men who sought to build a great coaster that everyone can enjoy. A coaster that still holds up pretty well today after 44 years of operation and counting. That's the mark of a well-designed, clever coaster. Thank you for watching. This video was a huge undertaking to put together, so the next Clever Coasters video probably won't be out anytime soon. But if y'all want to see more videos like this, leave a like and a comment down below, and feel free to subscribe. Until then, this is the Clothoid Looper, signing off.